I know, Heather, you've been working on looking at particular parts of the brain that seem to trigger, uh, I guess, what we would consider sort of moral responses. And I, I just want to figure out what, what does brain science tell us so far? I mean, does, can, can, we, can we look at a particular part of the brain and say, oh, that, that seems to generate feelings of empathy, for instance? Yeah. I mean, I'm more looking at immoral responses, but um, conversely, the research that's looking at moral responses coincides nicely with what I'm finding. Um, but then there's two questions, and then there's empathy. So empathy is great. I mean, we can see circuit, a, a very unique circuit in the brain light up when, when people are experiencing empathy. Another a really interesting study is that with olfaction, which is a very basic sense. Um, we, we built this ol olfactometer so we can give people different sense in the scanner and look at what's happening when their brain um, is lighting up. And this is, I'm going to talk about a study that we didn't um, do ourselves, but I think it's a really interesting study involving olfaction, where they collected sweat from people who were uh, about to go to the, who were working out at the gym, so neutral sweat. They collected sweat from other people who were uh, undergoing an anxious situation, like they were about to jump out of a plane um, or they're about to take a really hard exam. And then they gave these anxious and neutral sweats to a, another person who consciously would smell it and claim they couldn't tell the difference between these two. And they gave them these odors then while they were in the scanner. And what they found is that even though consciously they say, oh, they smell the same, um, their empathy network in the brain would lit up when they smelt the anxiety sweat. So even you know in odor, we're picking up on things, and and um, and so that's clear. We're getting a sort of nice neural signature of a kind of empathy network. Um, but making moral decisions is a little bit um, is interesting. It, there's no one part of the brain. Again, there's different parts that are involved in different aspects of it of making these moral decisions. So on the on the one side, when when I have patients who have a lesion to a part of the orbital, it's called the orbital prefrontal cortex. It's a part of the prefrontal cortex. They have difficulty, you know, they're going for that immediate reward. They will make a decision. They can't They can't hold their impulses, so they'll do things that maybe have very negative uh, consequences for the future, but they just cannot seem to control themselves. There's, you know, talking about pedophilia, there was a, a, a really, a, a, this sort of the modern day Phineas Gage study where this uh, man around in his 40s developed pedophilia symptoms. Um, they were gonna put him in jelly, started getting headaches. Uh, they did an MRI, they saw a big tumor in his right orbital prefrontal cortex. They removed the tumor, symptoms went away. He was allowed to return home um, where he had a young stepdaughter, his daughter. And then about a year later, the symptoms came back and sure enough, the tumor had grown back. You know, So it's really getting at this correl uh, causation rather than I mean, that's correlation. A, that's a fascinating example, which obviously raises some profound mm -hmm. philosophical questions. I mean, is that to say that uh, He's off the hook. He's not responsible. He's got he's got the brain tumor. No, uh, it leads to a lot of uh, you know exactly how much re how much do we hold people responsible? Well, I mean, and, and I mean, just it's a slippery slope because you could carry that argument. I mean, in in theory, everything that that we do is is a product of something going on in our brain. So it's it might not be a brain tumor, but it might be something else that would sort of push us in one direction. It, so are we basically sort of saying you know ultimately free will goes out the window? Yeah, I mean, well, let me just to finish up that story. The, the, just the other thing is that when people are making these moral decisions, that part of the brain, the ventral medial prefrontal cortex, lights up. So we know it is involved in making these moral decisions. So then the question becomes, yes, if you have a lesion there, if you have under activation or maybe a subtle abnormality or neurochemical imbalance, you know, it can get to the point of very of subtle differences. And so what does that mean? Now, as a neuroscientist, I think um, m much of the evidence suggests that free will is an illusion. You know, this concept of free will, it, the brain is making decisions unconsciously all the time or our perception of having freely decided sort of comes a little bit after the fact. There's a lot of studies done in the 80s, Benjamin Libet and more modern studies, which show that you can, the brain, you can predict which way a person's going to go, like press a button left or right up to 10 seconds before they're consciously aware of the intention just by looking at brain activation. So the brain kind of gears up to make a decision and then at some point you get the conscious of intention of I'm willing this and then you do the behavior. But there's this whole buildup beforehand. So, you know, and again, if you tell people though that the free will is an illusion, some psychology studies show that they tend to act out um, more, on, they act more unethically mm -hmm. um, and immorally. I mean, but what, so what, I mean, what do you do with that? I mean, are, is, is this an argument for we ultimately don't really have 
moral responsibility? No, of course not, because you also have free won't. You can simply override those <laughs> urges. Wait, 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 wait. No, but, but that was <laughs> Benjamin Livett's argument. But a recent study came out, it was 2013, by Patrick Hagard's group in, at UCL, where they looked at free won't, and they had people to, they can move, and at any point they could then not do it. And there was still a, a neural precursor okay. to it, the but not. It's still your brain making the choice. I would say you have unconscious free will, but not the well, consciousness comes after. Wherever it comes from, it's still you making the choice, so you are morally culpable for your actions. On a sliding scale of degrees of freedom, most of us, most of the time, in most circumstances, are culpable and make decisions that we should be held responsible for. Yes, Mr. Oft, the guy with the brain tumor, or frontal cortex, or somebody with you know a horrific background, drug addictions, you know, the extreme cases, yes, of course, their degrees of freedom are fewer than ours. Uh, simply by physical constraints on their brain. So, and the laws already deal deals with this. You know, these mitigating circumstances, crimes of passion, uh, you know, addictions, and you know these kinds of things, tumors, uh, you know, horrific backgrounds. We we tend not to hold them quite as responsible, and we give them you know different kinds of punishments for that. Well, and I so I think we I think the law has been adjusting itself according to the way the science understands the workings of the brain, while still holding us morally responsible most of the time for most people under most, otherwise you, you won't have a civil society without that. I would argue, yes, people still have to be held responsible for their actions, but for a slightly different, not because they have free will as, as the classic kind of, the way we've defined free will, as you could have done otherwise in the same exact situation if everything was exactly the same, but in the sense that we have evolved the capacity to have self-control. And if you look at a person's brain, like, People are held responsible in the law. For example, a child isn't held as responsible if they commit a crime than an adult because they don't have a fully formed prefrontal cortex. They don't have the capacity to have self-control or a person with brain damage in that part of the brain or a psychiatric patient who ca simply can't do it. But we do have the ability to, the brain has evolved to have self-control. So we hold people responsible for their actions to the extent that they have the capacity to have self-control, which is a different, slightly different thing than the classic sort of Cartesian definition of free will, which according to neuroscience, we don't really have. Christian, do yeah. you want to jump in here? So, uh, lots to be said here. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and needless, needless to say. Um, so, I, I tend to side with those um, who believe in more responsibility and free will as well. Um, in the philosophical world these days, that's the majority view, despite, and philosophers are quite well informed about this empirical research and are still uh, holding on to both free will and more responsibility. Really? Um, Most philosophers believe in free will? Uh, so, they can't yes. help it. I mean, they're philosophers. <laughs> now, <laughs> <laughs> um, but but there's free will and there's free will. There are different kinds of free will, different positions about on the free will debate. Uh, so there's this. Um, you were alluding to kind of Descartes position. It's philosophers called a libertarian position. Nothing to do with, with political politics. We're not going to get into that. Um, but uh, where it's like you said, uh, ability to do otherwise. Um, this kind of ultimate responsibility rests with the agent. Um, and then there's this other position, which is kind of called compatibilism, which says that determinism and free will can both exist side by side. And that they're, hence the name compatibilism, they're compatible with each other. And so you can have determinism uh, at the neural level, and you can have free will and resp more responsibility too. And sociologically speaking, most philosophers are OK with I, uh, one or other of those positions. Very few are willing to go down the path of, of hard determinism, which just wipes away moral responsibility and free will altogether. Um, so I, I think we have some uh, agreements here. The, the very tricky thing to do, though, is to, to where to draw the line between the, the tumor case and the normal case. Um, what is it specifically? So this idea of self-control, um, what is it specifically about self-control that grounds more responsibility in a way that the tumor doesn't. Um, if, after all, it's, if this is just another um, set of processes going on in the brain, why is it a privileged set of processes as opposed to some other sets of processes that are not privileged and that take away more responsibility? 